You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. To MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Reproductive psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to. Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so they may experience physical and emotional well being and find joy in motherhood. Please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I'm also mom to three kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So throughout the show, I'm going to remind you that you can call in and ask questions live on air or give your thoughts about how you're being kind. We're going to get to that. The number is 866-451-1451. And, you know, we'd love to hear from you today. Um, So today is World Kindness Day. And I'm so excited because we have the psychiatrist who has literally written the book and started the movement, the Mm -hmm. Be Kinder movement, Dr. Eva Ritvo, she is here with us to talk about kindness, why kindness matters, why do we, why are we kind, like, why not go through our lives in a bubble, because, and the reason is, we shouldn't, because actually it's good Mm -hmm. for us, and it's good for the person we're being kind to, and we're going to learn why, the big why. I mean, frankly, I I think being kind is so important. It's such a wonderful thing to be kind. Um, but for anyone who's skeptical, we're going to learn why it's so important. So welcome, Dr. Eva. Uh, thank you, Carly. I'm really excited to be with you, especially on World Kindness Day. It feels uh, just perfect to me, and I'm so grateful to you. Thank you very much. Now, tell me, so you wear a lot of hats, a lot of hats. Can you tell me what you do? <laughs> well, um, I like to say that I have three, three main hats. Um, and uh, once I became a mother, I realized that I have excess energy. So I think that's why I have three hats. Before I had children, I just thought I was sort of normal. But then once I had children, I was running them ragged. I said, oh, I maybe I have a lot of energy or something. So I think that's why I have three different hats on. So my first hat um, is my training. And like you, I'm an MD. So I am a psychiatrist and um, have been practicing now close to 30 years. And so that's my first hat. I have a private practice on Miami Beach. And I'm actually sitting in that office right now. And I will be uh, meeting with a patient as soon as you and I are done. So that, that's hat number one, and that's been my primary hat. Um, and then as we, you know, get older and go through life, we take on other hats and other responsibilities. So one of the things that really has profoundly altered my journey in life is um, during my residency training, I had a, my first daughter born. And uh, right when I finished my training, got my first job at the University of Miami, I found out that she was born with an area of her brain that, that didn't develop. Um, and so she's had a lot of challenges since then. And obviously there's a great irony that, you know, as a young psychiatrist, just starting to help people through their brain diseases that I would have a child with a, with a brain disorder. So that has taken my 
my life and my daughter's life on a very non-traditional path. And that gave me the wonderful fortune of putting on my second hat. And my second hat is a project that I'm really passionate about, and it's called the Bold Beauty Project. And that's a project where we take women with disabilities, like my daughter, and we pair them with volunteer photographers, and we ask them to work collaboratively for the woman to figure out how she wants to be her most bold and beautiful. Then they take a photo, and then our, our nonprofit will create an art show with a local team. So we have the opportunity to meet very inspiring women with disabilities, I would say around the country, but we're actually about to have our first international show. So now I can say around the country and around the world. So that feels really good. Um, so it's a really empowering experience for the woman with a disability. Uh, it's a very unique experience for the photographer because they have to work collaboratively with their model and really bring forward the, the model's vision of beauty. And oftentimes our photographers are used to working with a very different kind of model. Um, so we've heard things like this was the most challenging shoot of my life and this was the most meaningful shoot of my life and I'm changed forever from the shoot. I'll never forget it. So. We feel that we have a big impact on our photographers as well. And then we mostly we get to impact our audiences uh, because we show these, you know, online and in various places. And each woman's image is shown alongside her biography. And many people don't have the opportunity to get to know people with disabilities. And the women that we choose are incredible women. I could go on and on five radio shows about them um, and what they've overcome. And it's really powerful to get to learn about them and it gives you a different perspective for your own life. And I think it's really helped me uh, maybe not whine about things that other people might complain about, but when you have the perspective of having worked with, you know, a hundred women for whom, you know, brushing their teeth is a challenge, uh, getting out of bed is an impossibility without help. It really gives you a different perspective and it's taught me so much about kindness, which then brings me to the third hat and why I have the great fortune of being with you today, Carly, which is in 2017, I published my third book, which is called Be Kinder, B-E-K-I-N-D-R. And it's a book that has 64 different stories about kindness and then interwoven different things that I think you might want to know, the reader might want to know about kindness, including World Kindness Day is mentioned in my book. So those are my three hats. I, I will just jump in because for one quick second in terms of um, the Bold Brave Beauty, pro- I, I, re- I watched, I kind of got sucked into a vortex of it because it is amazing. And oh. um, there's one woman who um, just she and her um, running partner, I think they yeah. for the New York Marathon this past week, yeah. They just yeah. um, made the record for fastest mar- I mean, marathon yeah. um, for a woman with a disability. And as a runner, I was so inspired. Like, just. Uh, well, know. Carly, thank, thank you for, for, for diving into the website. It's the Bold Beauty Project. And um, a good way for listeners to get a quick overview is our 13-minute video by Michael LaFrance which is on our home That video, wow. That video, talk about, get some Kleenex. It's amazing. It's, oh, Carly, you're so, you are so kind. <laughs> you're making me feel so good. Yeah, we no. love that video. We're so grateful to our, to our videographer because he really captured the, the spirit, I think, of the project. And we really do want to pull you in, um, make you cry, make you smile, but mostly make you reflect. Uh, about how beautiful these women are. And you mentioned Carrie, and, uh, you know, I talk a lot about Carrie. I do a lot of things with her because in addition to being a bold beauty model and a Be Kinder contributor, she's also one of my closest friends, and she lives in my same condominium. Um, and I'll be seeing her tomorrow night to the event, and we've been texting all morning. Carrie is, is probably, you know, if not the, one of the most remarkable humans I've ever met. In fact, one of our mutual friends, another bold beauty model, said that Carrie is actually a spiritual being having a human experience. And that, that stuck with me because she's just so remarkable. Um, so she ran the New York City Marathon, although running would not be the right word because Carrie was disabled from an accident when she was 26. She's actually now 72. 
So she was pulled in the New York City Marathon by a woman who also defies understanding. I don't know how she does what she does. They did the marathon, I think, in three minutes and around 50, 50, three hours and 50 minutes. Um, and yeah. They beat the Guinness Book of World Record by five minutes which is a long, long time in, in marathon time. Um, and, it is. and her running partner is, is, I think, 48 or 49 years old. So, uh, you know, every time I have an ache and pain, I'm like, well, of course they do. I'm so old. And then I think, well, wait a minute. Karen just broke the Guinness Book of World's Records. She's not that much younger than I am. So, again, it kind of gives you perspective. And uh, Carrie's favorite sayings are, you know, anything is possible, together we can. Um, and that's what they show, and they are running to raise awareness um, so that all people can push past their perceived limitations. Uh, well, I was so inspired. I mean, uh, I well, we, we really, are, really was. For, for your listeners who want to learn more about Carrie, her organization is called Thumbs Up International, and um, they work to pair able-bodied athletes with differently abled athletes so that they can compete. And they do everything from 5Ks up through, um, by the way, this Guinness book is not really that big a deal compared to their last one, frankly. Uh, Carrie and her running partner, Karen, got the Guinness Book of World's Records for, now, this is not an exaggeration, and this is true, three triathlons in eight days. Oh gave them the Guinness Book of World Records for the most triathlons completed in, completed in a month by a person carrying a person. I mean, it's crazy, wow. right? Crazy. It it's was um, amazing. 44, 44 hours of exercise in eight days. I'd like the listeners to check in with themselves and ask themselves, do they do 44 hours of exercise in 52 weeks? And these That's, ladies did it in it's eight incredible. days. Eight days, and again, you know, they're they're in their late 40s and 72. You know, we're not talking about 20 year olds. So it just boggles the mind to think what people can do. Um, and in addition to this, this, these are brilliant women. Um, Carrie is a Harvard educated journalist, and her writing is superb. And she's running this nonprofit and keeping us all together. And she's inspired so many people and making so many people happy. I was at her surprise birthday party last Friday, and it. Oh, I mean, you're just, your heart melts. We had her up out of a wheelchair dancing. We had another young man, one of her athletes, up out of his wheelchair dancing. It, it just makes everybody feel so happy and inspired. And, yeah, please visit that website. If you're in Florida, the next race is December 8th. We're going to participate with the Arthritis Foundation at, at Jingle Ball. Um, that's a 5K. So that's a little bit more my speed. <laughs> and I usually walk. I usually walk those too. So it's really not about the athletic achievement. It's really about bringing people together, inspiring one another, and helping one another to, to reach each other's dreams, whatever that might be. And we have several 5Ks throughout the year. So don't be intimidated by That's caring. That's wonderful. Caring. And that... <laughs> Well, and that I think brings us to the notion of kindness, right? I mean, s supporting one another is a form of kindness, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I joined the board of Carrie's organization, because our messages are, are completely aligned. Um, her organization is all about, you know, helping one another. In fact, Carrie has a documentary that's called May I Help You. It's on YouTube. It's won, I think, three, possibly four Emmys. I think four, actually. I always feel like with Carrie, I'm exaggerating, but usually I'm underestimating. <laughs> so I can watch my words so carefully because I'm thinking, could this be true? Like I'm saying this, I'm, am I sure I'm telling the truth? Because it just defies understanding. But I actually think she got four Emmys, and I think I usually say three because it's just hard to wrap your head around all this stuff that she achieved. But anyway, in her documentary called May I Help You, she talks about by her having this disability, She's actually giving people the opportunity to help her, which then makes them feel so good. Because in that, that transaction is really the, the essence of what makes us human. And this is what I talk about in Be Kinder. And so when we, well, we, when we have to die. in a moment, we can possibly dive into that uh, topic. Yeah. Because I think it's vital to today's conversation. 
Absolutely. So we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Eva. And after the break, we're going to talk about, like, why why kindness? Yeah. What's the, again, like, where's the benefit? So don't go away. Yep, Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic. On the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Sander, and we are speaking to Dr. Eva Ritbo, who is a psychiatrist. She's an international speaker, an author, and founder of the Be Kinder Movement. And if you want to tell us how you're being kind today on World Kindness Day, give us a call, 866-451-1451. So why be kind? I mean, it seems to, like... It seems like a unnecessary question, but for some for some mm-hmm. people, kindness doesn't always come innately, right? I mean, I, there's some, right? So we learn how to be kind as a com- in terms of being part of a community, right? In kindergarten, um, right? We learn how to share and we learn how to be um, a good partner and things. But as adults, it seems like a lot of people forget those fundamental teachings and maybe for some people it's not an innate thing um why why should people be kind well first of all carly you said so many different things in there i could i could just take that sentence and answer that for the rest of our radio show um but let me let me let me back up a little bit because as i said my first hat is as a psychiatrist and I was very privileged to study some evolutionary psychology uh, in my uh, undergraduate year at Harvard. And um, I think it's really un- important to understand kindness. And I think it makes it a little bit easier to figure out why some people seem kind and why some seem unkind now. So let's back up a little bit, okay? So um, what, what's our name, right? Our name is, is mankind, humankind, right? So it's, it's right in our name. So kind is something that is so fundamental to us. And the understanding is that about 30 or 40,000 years ago, what changed, which allowed humankind to emerge and flourish the way it has, is that an area of our brain that's filled with mirror neurons expanded. Now, Carly, you may know what mirror neurons are from, from your educational background, or you may not, because they've only been discovered since the 1990s. So I'm not sure when you went to medical school, but they weren't, they weren't discovered when I went to medical school. Um, so mirror uh, neurons are- I went of- a year before Michael. <laughs> so I, I do, but yes, yes. keep on going. 
<laughs> um, so, so you're saying you know what mirror neurons are from from medical I, school? I do because I'm yes, but keep on going because most people won't. <laughs> when, when did you finish medical school? The, the same. I finished in two in two thousand and seven. Now I have to remember in two thousand and seven. Okay. But keep on going. Cause, I mean, it was not a fundamental so, part of my training. But it is interesting, you know, how much. Um, knowledge has expanded and someone like myself from 1991 medical school there was none of this was really known Um, and now we we know so much so the point being as as scientists have learned more about the brain we understand what makes us human and the idea is that these mirror neurons in our brain that mirror what we see so for example Carly if you and I go out to lunch and I'm really not that hungry but I watch you putting food into your mouth through your fork my brain is going to get triggered and pretty soon I'm going to be hungry. Um, and that also, you know, has to do with smell and everything else. But, um, we have a part of our brain that simply mirrors what we see. So that old phrase, you know, when you smile, the whole world smiles with you now has scientific basis because you're going to trigger the other person's, uh, mirror neurons for their smile. And they're going to want to smile back at you. So, that is what allowed humans to spread information so quickly. It's also what allowed humans to become so empathic because we could tell what other people are feeling. And it's also to the point of what Carrie says, which is when you help somebody, you actually feel good. So, Carly, if I see you and you've got your arm is hurt and I say, oh, Carly, you know, relax. I put my hands on you, I put a little Band-Aid on you, and you start to feel better, then my mirror neurons are are going to get triggered, and I'm also going to feel better. So humans are very much wired to be connected, not really in a verbal way. Mirror neurons are sort of pre-verbal, and it's, it's in that relationship that we were able to grow as a Uh, species and to differentiate ourselves and learn so much and communicate so much and develop so much because the transmission of information is so rapid. So humans are innately kind. The other thing that's important to understand is that our babies are extremely dependent for quite a long time and without care, they're going to die. So again, they need to transmit to us what they need and want in a nonverbal fashion because they don't speak. Our babies don't speak, and our little children aren't that good at communicating either. So, so much of human interaction is actually nonverbal, and that leads us to why are we having difficulty now? So we're having difficulty now for, for many reasons, but two that I think are salient. Number one, our mirror neurons design us to interact face-to-face, because that's how transmission of knowledge gets occurred through our mirror neurons. I know what you meant to say when I can see you. But when I can't see you and I can't feel what you were saying, I can misinterpret things very easily. And it's hard for me to be empathic for you. So what's happened in our age of technology is two fundamental shifts. Number one, we're not seeing people and we're not communicating as effectively. And so misunderstandings are occurring and things like bullying are occurring because we're not seeing the pain on that other person's face and we're not then stopping what we're doing. And then that leads us to take a different path in terms of how we communicate and how we treat people. And oftentimes that path can be unkind. The other enormous change that has occurred recently is if we think about, you know, our hunter-gatherer roots, our mirror neurons, We were in small groups of around 150 people that we spent our entire life with. So we knew them very well. And if something happened to them, we knew how to help, right? We all lived in the same community. We knew what the resources were. We knew what they normally looked and acted like. If they were different, we could, you know, jump in and we could help. But the problem now or the opportunity now, no matter which way you look at it, is all of a sudden we can know about 7 billion people. And how in the world are you supposed to care or help 7 million people. And so our brains are like, ah, and they're fried. And so we're all on this, you know, kind of bizarre emotional journey where we want to be human, we want to care, we want to connect, but technology has made it so different. And our brains cannot evolve in this simple one generation. And so we have a lot of difficulties in our current society and in our current relationships. 
So the reason I wrote Be Kinder was for people to just kind of focus back on what's innate. And innateness is kindness. That is fascinating. That, so I mean, that makes answer, so much I, sense. I apologize. I hope I'm not being too long-winded with you. But it's important, I think, for people to sort of step back and say, wait, why should we be kind? And why is it challenging to be kind right now? Because it is challenging. And, you know, it's challenging to be kind to ourselves right now. Again, think back to 150 people and you're wandering around and there's food. and You know, there's not a million different ways to be kind to yourself or to others. And you kind of did the best you could. Well, now you kind of wake up in the morning and your opportunities are limitless. And it's very confusing. And some people are being very unkind to themselves by too much technology, too much data, too much workaholism. And so, you know, that leads you down a path. Right nowadays, how many people are being unkind to the environment? I just flew to Los Angeles 24 hours for an event, which I really wanted to be there. But I thought, God, my carbon footprint, like, was it worth it? Should I have done that? So it's kind of an example of like, well, I was trying to be kind to my friend, but at the same time, I was being very unkind to the environment. So, you know, how do we balance all these things in this really complex world and complex time that we're living in? So it's, it's difficult. It's challenging. We have to be patient with ourselves and we might not always make the right choice. Um, but I think if we try to focus back on kindness to ourselves, kindness to others, kindness to animals, kindness to our planet, it will lead us to make more choices that, that are better. It's such an, I mean, it's a fascinating, I had never, you know, technology, obviously, we all, we all are aware that, you know, the whole notion of like being faceless behind a screen, people are inherently nastier to one another. But the fact that it actually limits kindness, when you say it makes perfect sense, but you know, it hadn't dawned on me in that way. I mean, it makes perfect sense. But I'm curious, kids, children especially, right, but even teenagers, frankly, because their frontal lobes, we know, not exactly fully developed, to say the least. Um, Correct. They, I mean, their ability to show empathy and, as a correlate, to be kind um, which are not the same thing, but um, is how, you know, how's, what's their capacity compared to adults, right? Um, and should we as parents look for our children to be kind? I mean, are, are we asking, you know, we tell our children to be kind, right? We, we try and model it, but is that a fair thing? Well, again, you, you ask such sophisticated, complex questions. Um, this is going to take another a deeper dive. Um, but just to start with, I, I do feel very sorry for teens growing up in this social media world. And I also feel, you know, parents today have it so much harder um, than, you know, even myself just, you know, a few years ago because of the impact of technology and social media and how how utterly challenging social media is when you're a teen and you're trying to rewire your brain and reshape your brain and your judgment just isn't there. And then you're inundated with, with so much data and it's really, it's very, very challenging. So I think it's important to, again, go back to the basics with our children. And of course we want to teach them to be kind. Of course we want to demonstrate kindness to them. And our expectations of what they can achieve will, you know, change as they get older and older. Um, but we have to remember that kindness is innate. And very small children can demonstrate kindness. There was one study of kids about a year old, and they were watching um, as a parent was sort of struggling with carrying too many packages to get to the door. And kids as one year old, as young as one, would try to help. They would visibly try to help. Um, so kindness back to what I was telling you earlier, is, is absolutely innate. And after our next break, which I imagine is coming very soon, there you go. We, can, we, can, we can talk about oxytocin and the difference in oxytocin receptors, and that helps some of us be uh, kind more easily than others and more naturally. So I think we should take a a bit of a deep dive into the oxytocin receptors after you hear from your sponsors. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and there you go. So we are going to take a break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Eva, and we're going to talk about oxytocin when we get back. Don't go away. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins, My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current and concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and we are speaking to Dr. Eva Ritvo in honor of World Kindness Day. And I want to remind you, you can give us a call, 866-451-1451. So just before the break, we were, you know, Dr. Eva said she was going to tell us about how oxytocin plays a role in kindness. So, you know... How does this, how does, you know, I, people think of oxytocin and they think of, maybe they think about breastfeeding, maybe they think about the love hormone, but how does it, is it involved with, uh, with kindness? So oxytocin, you, you mentioned the term love hormone and that's a nickname for oxytocin, but oxytocin is a, a, a neurohormone chemical that is released um, during certain acts that is actually very powerful and very powerfully connected to kindness. Um, so oxytocin is released, as you said, during breastfeeding, uh, during labor and delivery, um, but it's also released with touch, um, and it's also released uh, with sexual intimacy um, but, and hugging. Um, you can also release it by hugging your pet, and you can release it by getting into a warm shower that stimulates that, that warmth and closeness. You can take a warm blanket and wrap around you. There's a lot of ways to release oxytocin. And oxytocin makes us feel good. It makes us trust people more. And it creates a bond. It's also a powerful anti-inflammatory. So it leads, uh, leads to better wound healing. It decreases your blood pressure. And it's an absolutely wonderful chemical to try to secrete. And fortunately, it can be secreted when we're helping somebody. So if you have an opportunity to help somebody, to literally lend a helping hand, put a hand on them, put a hand on their shoulder, shake their hand, hug them, you are helping them, but you're also helping yourself because both people will be stimulating their oxytocin. There was a study that I read recently that said just um, five hugs a day um, allowed people not to get the common cold when they were exposed to the virus. They had two groups they exposed to the common cold virus. One got hugs, one didn't get hugs. And the group that got the hugs were able to fight off the virus better when they were exposed to it. So it's a, again, it really speaks to the fact that humans are wired to care from, for one another, and both people benefit in the process of that. 
So the interesting thing, Carly, about uh, your comment about why do some people seem kind and one pe- seem, seem, some people seem less kind is, listen, we're all different. We're not here to be the same. That would be terribly boring. Scientists have looked at the amount of oxytocin receptors in the brain, and it appears that about a third of people actually have more receptors for oxytocin in their brain. So what that means is when the oxytocin gets released, that one-third of people are going to be like, woo, 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 I love this stuff, more than the other two-thirds. So they're going to be more sensitive to the effects of oxytocin. Therefore, they're going to be more drawn to the kind act because they're going to be getting benefit from it. And if you think about this, I think it's kind of a liberation to know, hey, we're not all here to be equally kind. It's just not that simple. But probably about a third of us are wired to be kinder than the rest. And those are our nurses, our doctors, um, anybody in a helping profession, our school teachers, our firefighters perhaps, our police officers, anybody who chooses to spend their life helping people probably has more oxytocin receptors in their brain, therefore going to get more reward out of that profession, therefore going to be able to get through the burnout that comes with all these professions because they're exhausting when you're constantly seeing people suffering. So you mentioned on the break that you have three children and two of them seem to sort of get the kindness thing more innately. And that might be because they have more oxytocin receptors. The other thing is we're all different and we're all tuning into different information. So one person might look unkind, but it's just that they weren't paying attention to that same uh, data set. So it's not that they're unkind, but perhaps they're focused with somewhere else. And I think labeling people is very dangerous. So I don't think you want to label anybody as kind or unkind because all behaviors are, are complex. And hopefully we're all kind at some moments and unkind at other moments because sometimes life calls for unkindness. I sometimes yeah. joke my next book is called Be Meaner. Uh, because, you know, we can't find her all the time. It's exhausting. So um, everybody is different, and we have to allow room for that. And, again, that's why we'd be kinder. I'm not telling anybody what to do ever because that's not my belief. But my belief is if you could take responsibility for thinking more about kindness in all of its forms, ultimately that will help you. And as a psychiatrist, I try to help people live their most optimal life. It's so funny because um, I think people's – so two, it, I was saying during the break, two of my three kids are overtly what one would define as kind, right? So, you know, with one kid is crying, the other one will go over and give a hug very quickly, right? And yeah. my other child may not be the first one to do that. But, and and I was worried about that for a while, but then I stopped and I watched her behavior from a different angle and I was looking at it like, what, what does she do? What, you know, rather than kind of looking from my angle, like my view of kindness. And I realized she's the first person to make a card for someone if they're sick and she's the first person to, you know, she is very attuned to people in a different way and she's showing her her kindness in just a different approach so i think it, you know there's that also that aspect of like kindness comes in different forms um absolutely and you, so you know who talks about that quite quite nicely um is a book called five love languages by gary chapman and he yes. talks about how we can we can express our love in different ways, and not everyone is going to going to do it the same way. So, for example, you know, one of your children likes to hug. Well, that's one way of showing love. But you know, acts of service, making a card, is another way of showing love. And they're all wonderful, and they should all be embraced. And you want to show all of those different ways to your children, um, and you want to show them to your spouse and to other people. So the, the, the different ways that he talks about are words of affirmation, quality time, acts of service, physical touch, and, and, and gift giving. So there is, there's those five different love languages. But again, if we think about kindness, it's really, you know, and there's an unlimited way to be kind. And we want 
our children to be creative and to think out of the box and to think for themselves and exposing them to all different ways of kindness is really the best way for them to figure out what suits them and what's comfortable for them. Because it is beautiful how each child turns out so different from the other one. And the older they get, the more you'll see that. Which is, I think, the coolest part about parenting. Um, so I was also saying, we were talking during the break, um, and you know, you mentioned I should bring it up, and I think it's a good point. So I was saying, when I was growing up, and to this day, so my father is someone who is, you know, if you do something well, he is the first person to, um, can, you know, to mention it in a positive way. So you know, if we go skiing and uh, you go down the hill well, He's the first person, you look great out there, you know, now, but he doesn't do it in a gratuitous way. Meaning if, if you don't look great, he doesn't comment. Um, right. But, and it, it always rubbed off on me in a very positive way. So I'm very conscious of trying to um, be positive towards people. So if they, you know, if my son does very well on a, uh, on a paper, if he writes something, I'm like, that is great, sweetheart. I'm so proud of you. That is such a, you know, I, I'm effusive, but not inappropriately. You know, I, I don't, I'm not saccharine, sweet, but I but try to make other people feel good. Right. And you use words of affirmation as your love language because you learned that love language from your dad. And now you're passing that on to your children. And the one child who likes to make the cards, she might be making an act of service. And she might be expressing her love in a different way. And they're all equally valuable. But it's that love that connects us. It's that love that releases the oxytocin that makes us feel bonded and connected. And it's very important to do that. And if, if that's your love language, it's kind of interesting that you pick to be a radio host, right? So that you're going to share <laughs> right. well, there you as your profession. Well, but here's the question, though. So, you know, what of the people who say it's all a waste of time, meaning, you know, the people who are like, I give money to hmm. charities, but I, you know, my focus really is on my work and I, what, what's the, you know, I'm doing fine just the way I am. Right. Well, you know, again, I think we have to have a lot of respect for individual differences and each, each person's journey here is going to be very unique and Carly, something that may work for the two of us. You know, I'm so touched that you, you enjoyed the bold beauty videos and that you want to learn more, but you know, if somebody's not, well, you know, hopefully they bring other gifts to, to the world and to the relationship. Um, the person who's giving money, I would suggest maybe bringing that charitable act closer to home because when you write a check and you send a check, you don't oftentimes get that oxytocin boost because, well, sometimes it's hard to part with money to begin with, and then you don't really see the impact. So I think for somebody who's not really feeling inspired by that, they would want to try something kind of closer to home and see how that feels. So, for example, uh, on Thanksgiving or Christmas, maybe going to a homeless shelter and volunteering for the day and seeing how that feels. Or instead of just sending a check, participating in a 5K and raising money for a cause that they care about. These are the things that tend to impact people in a more positive way. And then once you're impacted positively, it's easier to get inspired and do it again and again. So we can, you know, um, try to change our behavior and, and make that, that, that charitable act closer to home so it feels better. Something simple like a neighbor who's not feeling well, dropping them off some food, uh, making sure that when you check out at the checkout counter, you say to somebody, hey, how are you feeling today or how's your day going? And have more of that that person to person interaction, and then see if it's more meaningful, and then if it inspires them to do more. It, it's it's so funny because when you do those things, people are quite surprised and in a positive way. They're taken aback. They appreciate it. Um, we have to take yeah. a break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Glo Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and after the break, um, we're going to talk to Dr. Eve about you know, is our society less nice than they used to be like why are people surprised when you're nice and kind okay stay with us all right 
Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the BBM Global Network. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomena while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. Thank Welcome you. back to MD, to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Dr. Eva Ritvo about kindness. So I was saying in the break, so um, the other day I was going for a run, which my listeners know I tend to do often, um, and I saw an elderly couple struggling to get out their door, and there were people walking by left and right but no one either maybe no one saw them let's go with that but you know either way um i stopped it took me maybe a minute at most and i held the door for them and what i was saddened by was how effusively appreciative they were and the reason that made me sad was because it it, you know it was so indicative of the fact that clearly that never happened or it very rarely happens that people offer help um and, you know, it was clearly the, they lived in a walk up and they, you know, this difficulty was probably not a unique experience. Um, why, why is, our, or let me rephrase it, is our society less kind than we used to be? Okay, so that's, that's a, a good question. And I think the answer is yes and no. I think if we look at, at it through one lens we say absolutely people are so unkind because all this you know so many things point to that right um, but at the other hand we're so much kinder because now through our inner connections globally we have so many people you know we have a whole new field called social entrepreneurship and so many people stepping up now trying to save the planet look we've got a 16 year old coming over on a boat from sweden trying to save the planet. It, it, we're, we're in massively shifting times. So I think what people need to be cognizant of is all this technology and all this stimulation, all this knowledge has made us unkind sometimes to our immediate surroundings because we are so busy thinking about so many different things. I remember one time I was giving a lecture in New York and right before, you know, one friend came up and said that, Somebody has got diabetes in the family. Somebody else came up and told me another bad story. Somebody texted me at the same time and told me something bad. And then I glanced on Facebook and there was more bad news. It's like uh, my brain was like completely fried. Like I had no idea who to be nice to, who to be kind to. And your natural instinct is like you just get overwhelmed and you shut down and you get numb because we are just aware of way too much. So there's too much data getting into our brain and 
that can make us appear unkind when it's not what we want to do, that we're overwhelmed because now we know about, you know, everybody from high school, college, everybody we've ever met, and we can't possibly take care of all these people. Um, and in terms of your interaction, you know, it's just horrifying to see how many people are not even making eye contact anymore because their nose is in their phone. So you get into the elevator, and of course people aren't holding a door open because they're reading a text. And they might be being very kind in that text. They might be saying, you know, oh, I'm so sorry you're not feeling well today. Can I bring you something when I come home? But they look to you as being very unkind because they're not even acknowledging that you might need help with a door. So I think it's a complex situation right now. And I think each person needs to take responsibility for saying how much knowledge really should I be taking in? How much should I really be doing a digital detox, putting a cell phone away, staying away from social media, and trying to connect with people in my immediate environment? And I think the problem is right now we just don't know the answer. And this change has occurred so fast without people really thinking about it. Um, And so we oftentimes are unkind because we're tired, we're exhausted, we're overwhelmed, and we're not looking at our surroundings. Um, my, my aunt was hit by somebody texting and driving, you know, the ultimate uh-huh. act of unkind. And it's That's taken awesome. her, you know, to cover. Um, my mother was in a car accident uh, shortly thereafter by somebody who was rushing to make a left-hand turn because we are just so busy and preoccupied, and it's really creating enormous uh, problems in the societal level. And so we each have to think about how we can be kinder to ourselves, how we can be kinder to the environment, and what are the limits? You know, not all of us can get up in the morning and fight world world's hunger. We have to do what, you know, we have to maybe come and sit in the classroom and look at the kids that are in front of us. So it's, a, it's, it's difficult to know the answers to this question. So I think we're becoming more kind in some ways and less kind in other ways. And it's, it's, it's turbulent at the moment. Um, but I love to hear that you're teaching your kids kindness because I think the next generation is going to be different because they're used to all this information and hopefully they can sort through it better because their brains are going to be growing up in this sea of information. And hopefully if we instill those human kind, those innate, those basic values to be kind to one another, they'll be able to sort through some of these problems perhaps better than, you know, the, the older folks. Uh, we can hope so, right? I mean, they won't have to contend with it being new, right? It will have okay. already, always been there. Now, if there were one or two salient points from today's show that you really hoped listeners walked away remembering, what would they be? Well, I think the number one is humankind and that we're naturally kind and that we should all try to see the best in ourselves and the best in one another and to try to connect on that level. You know, they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, keep your side of the street clean. And I think it's so easy right now for people to be pointing to the other side of the street and complaining, and they didn't do this, and they didn't do that, and I don't like this, and I don't like that. But that's not the solution. The solution is to be responsible for yourself and to create the best life that you possibly can and to integrate kindness across the board. So kindness to yourself, kindness to others, kindness to animals, kindness to the planet, all those things. Keep that in the front of your consciousness and try to go forward from that space. And today is World Kindness Day, so there's not a better day to start to think about, you know, what does that mean for me? How could I do better for myself? And to try to integrate some of those changes. And it can be something as simple as, you know, we're overstimulated and we're not getting enough sleep. So, the way I'm going to be kinder to myself, and particularly for the kids, is to go to bed a little bit earlier. There's a wonderful um, index, the World Happiness Index, and the number one thing that makes teens happy is proper amount of sleep. And we think that happiness is some fancy, elusive thing, you know, that we can buy in a store or get a diploma on our wall, but actually it's just mental health, and mental health comes from sleeping well, exercising properly, uh, having good relationships. And all of those things have have a root in kindness, being kind to your own body, sleeping properly, nourishing your body properly, exercising it properly. Then the next layer is being kind to other people once you're feeling good and positive. And then you can take that out into the world and, and help the world. So I think it's sort of that paradigm shift. How can I be kinder 
How can I be kinder to myself? How can I be kinder to others? I, I love that. And I mean, I love that. Now, very quickly, because we're running out of time for our listeners, how can they find your book, Be Kinder? And what is the Be Kinder website and your website? Uh, well, thank you for a kind question at the end, Carly. I appreciate that. Um, it's B-E-K-I-N-D-R dot com. So it's like Be Kinder, but I took away the last E. So B-E-K-I-N-D-R dot com is my website. And the book is anywhere books are sold online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Books are for sale on my, my website. Also for sale on my website, which I personally like a lot, are hats that say Be Kinder. And the reason I like that is because what we talked about earlier, which is everyone has their darn nose in the phone. And today I'm wearing a T-shirt that says Be Kinder because I think it's great if you can stop a stranger and they say, what does that mean? I don't get that. Is that Be Kinder or what is that? And you say, no, it's Be Kinder. I'm part of a, a global initiative to help people think more about kindness. And everybody who listens today, everybody who listens today is part of the Be Kinder global initiative. And they are now part of this process to try to help everybody focus more on kindness. So you can wear a hat, you can wear a shirt, you can look at the book, you can keep the book by your bedside. I always say it's not really a reading book, it's a thinking book. Just open it up to any page, anytime you want. Um, and also the boldbeautyproject.com. And I appreciate that you fell into a little bit of a rabbit hole on that. And we also have the Texas Bold Absolutely. Beauty Project, which is going to be your next rabbit hole when you have time. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Well, thank you. And thank you to our listeners. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network, TuneIn Radio and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. And happy World Kindness Day. Go make someone's day a little brighter. Until next. Next time, be well, enjoy, be kind to yourself, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.